This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Hey there, cat lovers. Welcome to Nine Lives with Dr. Cat. I'm your host, Dr. Catherine Prim, and I'm a small animal veterinarian and crazy cat lover. And today I have Dr. Joe Barches with us. He's been with us before. He's he's a veteran nine liver, but he is extremely busy. He is a veterinary nutritionist who travels all over the country and speaks and teaches students and sees patients sometimes at the same time. So we're going to talk with him a little bit today about just food preferences in cats and kind of just what's the deal with cats and what they eat. And so we'll be right back with Dr. Barches after a quick word from our sponsors. Take a bite out of your competition. Advertise your business with an ad in Pet Life Radio podcasts and radio shows. There is no other pet-related media that is as large and reaches more pet parents and pet lovers than Pet Life Radio. With over 7 million monthly listeners, Pet Life Radio podcasts are available on all major podcast platforms. And our live radio stream goes out to over 250 million subscribers on iHeartRadio, Odyssey, TuneIn, Stitcher, and other streaming apps. For more information on how you can advertise on the number one pet podcast and radio network, visit PetLifeRadio.com slash advertise today. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back to Nine Lives with Dr. Cat on Pet Life Radio. And as I said, I have Dr. Joe Barches with us here today. Hey, Dr. Barges. Hey, how are you? Hey, I'm doing great. So tell my listeners a little bit about you and, and a day in the life of you. Well, I wish it was that easy because every day is very different. So uh, I guess in general terms, when I'm at school, I go into the clinic and we take care of our patients. If classes are in session, then I often have to run over to uh, you know, a classroom and give lectures. And I have graduate students, a couple of doctoral students and residents that we're doing projects with. So we're doing research. So it's it's sort of all over the place with no one particular schedule other than when on clinics, you know, we receive cases and then do procedures and we try and work everything else around that. And where are you most of the time? Oh, probably more in the clinic than any anywhere else. Um, I do internal medicine. And so we're on 20 some weeks a year for medicine, but I also do nutrition and I also do what's called interventional radiology, which is doing things like laparoscopy and using lasers to break up stones and placing stents in dogs who are obstructed because of cancer or vascular procedures where we're closing off uh, an abnormal vessel or something like that. And so I'm usually down there almost every week for several days, even when I'm not on clinics doing, doing all of that. And you're at Georgia, right? I am at the University of Georgia, Go Dogs in Athens, Georgia. I might say the national champion, Georgia Go Dogs. <laughs> Hey, I'm Go Dogs too, but I'm I'm Mississippi State. So yeah, well, you know, I forgive you. <laughs> well, so you're a really terrific guest because I like to pick your brain because in clinical practice I get lots of questions about nutrition and specifically cats because they they're just quirky and they're cats and we've talked about that before. So can we talk a little bit about? how kittens might develop their food preferences? Sure. Um, And I guess I would be classified, uh, we would be classified as a crazy cat person as well. And we've got, we've got a couple of cats that we caught as kittens that were feral and that we ended up keeping Stevie Ray and Vaughn. Um, So Stevie's our female and Ray and Vaughn are our males. And they're now going about four or five years. So we've been through the process of, you know, basically after weaning, how do you get them to eat different types of food. And I would say there are a couple of things to keep in mind. One is cats are very driven by texture. And the other is they're not overly keen on new things. So once they get this preference for a taste, a texture, uh, whatever it might be, it can be very difficult to convince them to eat something else, even if it's in their own best interest. Like, you know, they have kidney disease and need a, a diet for kidney disease. 
So one of the things you can do in terms of what kittens do is they develop their preference based on what the mother eats. And so if you are raising kittens or you get kittens from someone who has the queen and the kittens and the queen is eating one type of food and the kittens will eat that one type of food, then you're starting to set that preference early on and that makes it hard to break. What we learn to do is to not let that happen by feeding them different types of foods. And so being a board of nutritionists, we make our own homemade diet, which is a very high protein, low carbohydrate diet. We mix with that canned foods made by different companies, different flavors, mainly that are high protein, low carbohydrate, like you would feed for diabetes or um, recovery or something like that. And then we also give them different types of dry food, usually as treats and in toy puzzles. And so it allows us to jump around in different foods they haven't developed a specific preference. Even the treats we use are varied. And I will say, going on four or five years of age now, for being indoor cats only, they're very muscular. And I'd like to think it's because of the homemade diet and the fact that they're on much higher protein and very low carbohydrate diets as carnivores. So cats are on keto, at least your cats? Not really. Uh, not, not exactly in the strictest sense of the word. Ketogenic diets are actually high fat diets. And it forces the body to use the body fat to make what are called ketone bodies. But these are not high fat diets that we make or use. They're actually high protein diets. And so they don't develop the ketones, the ketosis that you typically talk about when you're referring to ketogenic diets. And I guess that's a topic for a human nutritionist. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, a whole, whole different story. <laughs> yes, a different ball of wax. Now, you mentioned puzzle toys, and that's one of my favorite soapboxes. And I talk with all of my cat owners about puzzle toys. What kind of puzzle toys do you have for Stevie Ray and Vaughn? Yeah, so we have, um, we have more puzzle toys for them than I actually have like clothes. They have a whole room and it's not only in their room, it's spread throughout the entire place. And what we, again, and my advice is cats are in to cat owners are cats are innate hunters. They like to hunt. They like to stalk. And so you want to play into that innate desire to be a hunter. So although we put their food bowls down in in more specific areas, the food puzzles allow them to use different senses, different hunting things, different, you know, stocking. And they actually like the puzzles. I'll put their food down, say in the morning, and I'll fill up their puzzles. They will go play with the puzzles. And even though there's dry food in it, they'll only eat a few kibbles. They just like playing with the puzzles. Then they'll go back and eat their other food. And then throughout the day, they end up going to nibble on on the dry food. The puzzles we have, um, these cats are insanely intelligent. And so we actually are using high level dog food puzzles because the cat food puzzles are too easy. And so we had friends who had border collies, uh, you know, that are herders and they couldn't figure them out. They gave them to us and we gave them to the cats and within, you know, five seconds, they figured it out. And so they had learned to open drawers and turn things and lift stuff. And I mean, it's just, it's amazing to watch them hunt for their food in these puzzles. Yay, cats. I completely believe that cats are super intelligent. Also, I'm, I'm surprised that the herding dogs couldn't figure out the puzzles, but I'm not surprised your cats could. So. <laughs> <laughs> so every time we talk about anything on this show, I always kind of want to throw in sort of the veterinary perspective and how my listeners could know that it might be time to call in the vet. What do you think about a sudden change in a food preference for a cat? Do you think that could warrant a vet visit? Yeah, and, and let's take even a further step back first and then get to that. And that is what happens if the cat doesn't want to eat? So they put down food and the cat sort of turns up its nose. You know, cats like to be nibblers rather than meal feeders and we kind of force them to eat meals based on our schedule and so you know once you know twice a day sometimes three times a day but when they have the opportunity to nibble that's what they like to do and again we mix this homemade diet which is very high in water and add water to it with the canned food we did we leave it down all day you know and people will say you can't leave that down because it goes bad they don't care and in fact when it gets that little crust on it they sort of like the crunchiness to it um, but they they eat them all. Uh, they eat all the food throughout the day and, and throughout the night because we feed them twice a day. 
So the first thing would be if they're eating well naturally and then suddenly they don't eat their food, and especially if it's more than one meal, then that should alert you as a cat owner to say something's not right. And whether it is a problem with the food or whether it is a problem with your cat becomes the question. And if you wait too long to take them into the veterinarian, other bad things can happen because of them not eating. So it's important that if even if they're still feeling okay, you might try a different food if they're not eating to take them in because it usually means something's going on. And again, it may be something going on with the cat rather than with the food. Then the other is it could be the food. If you've opened a new can of uh, or a bag of food or opened new cans of food or bought new and they don't look the same, they don't smell the same, cats are going to tell you that long before you recognize it. And so you want to look at that. Or if it's very old food, people tend to take the bag and pour it into a container and then, you know, 40 pounds of cat food lasts like an entire lifetime for a cat. And the food will go bad over over time the, and become sort of rancid. And even before you can sense it, the cats cats will. So you want to you want to look at all of that as well, and then decide: Do I need to take them in right now, or can I try something different? But you don't want to wait too long. The other is what happens if their food preferences change. And and in most situations, again, cats get locked into their preference, and they don't want to change. And it's harder to actually get them to change than you notice that their preferences do change. But especially with underlying diseases like kidney disease or whatever. Sometimes they'll eat really well, and then they just don't like that food anymore, and it's not a problem that their kidney disease has gotten worse, and you just have to try something different. And they'll eat it, and then sometimes they'll eat it for a while, and you have to change it again. So it all comes down to knowing what your cat's like when they're healthy, and then getting to know them even more when they're not healthy, and we're using diet as part of our treatment. So you said, of course, that you are a veterinary nutritionist and you can, you know, safely put together a meal or meals and meal plans for your cats. But I want to delve into that just a little bit more. Um, I want to take a quick break and then I want to come back and talk to you and pick your brain about home cooked food. So we'll be right back. Molly, here's your dinner. (coughs) Zeus, that's not your food. Don't let that happen to your precious cat. Elevate your cat's eating experience with the Cat Tree Tray. The Cat Tree Tray keeps your cat's food off the floor and conveniently located on the cat tree. It's the perfect way to eat. It's a beautiful wrought iron tray that easily attaches to your cat tree and keeps dogs and other critters out of your cat's dish. A must for multi-pet households. There's a 6-inch tray for large bowls and a 4-inch tray for smaller bowls. Purchase your Cat Tree Tray today. Go right now to CatTreeTray.com. That's CatTreeTray.com. C-A-T-T-R-E-E-T-R-A-Y.com. Let's Talk Pets. Let's Talk Pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. <laughs> Welcome back to Nine Lives with Dr. Cat on Pet Life Radio. Dr. Joe Barchis and I are discussing all things cat and diet. And I wanted to get some more information about his experiences in home cooking foods for his normal, healthy adult cats. So can you expound on that a little? Yeah, cats cats are, when people want to switch to homemade diets, it can be really tricky in cats because, again, they... Early on in life, they develop these preferences for certain textures in particular. They like food when it's kind of more towards body temperature. And so, you know, putting a can of food in the refrigerator and then taking out while it's cold, a lot of cats won't eat that. And so then trying to switch them from this commercial food to a, you know, towards a more whole ingredient, homemade food can be really difficult because they just don't want it. They just don't want to make the change. That was, again, a reason when we cut these cats as kittens, as feral kittens, we started doing that to begin with. And now we, you know, we can change the ingredients in the diet, although we don't usually change them that much. But it's basically chicken breast and chicken thighs with a little bit of fish oil in it. And they like kale and spinach. So we add that in um, to give some a little bit of fiber and a little bit more water. And then a multivitamin minerals a supplement that's designed to be used for homemade diets and a probiotic. And that is it. 
And so it is like 75, 80% protein, about 10% fat and like 2% carbohydrate. It is a really high protein diet, but they love it. And again, we'll mix it with, with commercial foods and we'll, we'll rotate those things around. Sometimes we add chicken livers to them. Sometimes we add some other things as we make, and we usually make about two to three months worth of food at a time and just freeze it in little Ziploc baggies that give about three days worth of food. So it, it's, we're changing out all the time. So if a cat needs to be on a homemade diet, the suggestions I have are to work with a veterinary nutritionist, somebody who is board certified in veterinary nutrition, who knows how to formulate diets, knows how to meet the nutrient requirements, knows how to formulate a diet if there's a specific reason to make it different than an adult maintenance food, say a cat has kidney disease or diabetes or stone disease or something like that, and can make a diet that can be fed long-term without causing either excesses or deficiencies. And you will likely need to transition them slowly. And by slowly, I mean more than three or four days, like a lot of people talk about. There are studies in cats with kidney disease, for example, where trying to transition them from their maintenance food to a kidney diet, therapeutic kidney diet can take, you know, two months. And so if they don't make the transition right away, don't give up, just go much more slowly. And many cats then will, will make the transition. So I talk with clients a lot about questions about this kind of thing, and and it seems like they never really believe me when I say, I'm worried about you being able to get this balanced. I really want you to work with a veterinary nutritionist for this problem or that problem. And I mean, what do you say when people say, well, I mean, cats used to be wild and they just ate whatever they could kill. I mean, what, what do you say? What can happen if the diet isn't balanced? Well, and that, that is true. Out in the wild, they did catch birds and, and rodents and snakes and things like that. And if you actually look at what they're composed of, and there's actually some studies that have looked at what's the nutrient profile of a bird or a mouse or whatever, they tend to be high protein, kind of um, not high fat, but sort of moderate and very low carbohydrate. And so that's one of the reasons why we formulate the homemade diet. It is much more closer to a prey than, than even commercial foods, although the commercial foods get close, um, at least some do. So the issue is, yeah, that's true. But what they also did is they didn't eat one thing, right? They didn't just eat field mice for every meal and they didn't just, or just eat birds, right? They ate different things. So they got a mix of stuff. Whereas when we're feeding commercially available food, many people just feed one thing, whether it is the exact same diet meal after meal, or it's the same company just making different flavors of the same diet. It still is the same amount of protein, amount of fat and all that. And so they're not getting that variety unless you take the time to feed them a variety, which again is a reason why we use diets that are high protein, low carbohydrate, which are commercial diets that are designed for feeding cats with diabetes mellitus or feeding cats who have been ill and are recovering, you know, critical care kind of diets. And, and there's about, you know, eight or 10 and we just buy, you know, a case of wine and we just mix them all up and we get about three meals out of it or two meals and we just change the diets around and they, they could care less if we flip around like that. So it is true that in the wild, they catch their own. They still do have diseases that are nutritionally related, but again, they eat a variety of things. They don't eat one thing day after day. Yeah. And if they have a disease in the wild, it doesn't end the same as if they have a disease, true. In, they have a disease in the wild. They, yeah, they don't get the care they need and it's kind of, you know, whatever natural selection to take them out of, out of the community as it were. So do you see a specific preference? You said you use some chicken or whatever. Do you think that there is a certain flavor that most cats like? Because everybody used to say, oh, fish, cats love fish. But I have a lot of cat patients that don't like fish. What do you see? So interestingly, cats did not evolve from fish, from eating fish, right? Cats were thought to have originated at least as far back as in Egypt, which although there is a Nile River, cats didn't actually eat fish, um, at least from what I've read from you know, anthropological texts and things like that. So I don't know that cats necessarily want or like fish. Our cats, we don't really feed them fish. Um, they like fish treats though. We give them dehydrated fish, but we give them dehydrated chicken and dehydrated other proteins as well. The problem with fish is 
if you store it for long periods of time because of the types of fats that are in them, they can, even when you add antioxidants to it, they sometimes get a weird flavor to them. And some fish have a sort of a tinny flavor anyway. And what we often use is chicken because it's not as high in fat and it, there's more consistency in the, you know, in chicken meat, chicken breast, chicken thigh, although there are differences between those two. Whereas if you say just feed fish, there's huge differences between halibut and tuna and, you know, mackerel or whatever. And just like saying I feed ground beef, well, there's huge differences between a 95-5, you know, 5% fat ground beef and an 80-20, there's 20% ground beef. And probably the worst protein to work with for, as from a nutrition standpoint is pork, because the different cuts of pork have widely different amounts of fats and, and amino acids and things like that. And it get, can be really tough to balance out a diet, you know, with a certain cut of pork. Chicken is a whole lot easier and it gives you a lot more flexibility in how you can modify the other nutrients and what ingredients you can use with chicken. I don't know if cats just like chicken, but they do seem to like chicken-based foods even more so than fish. Well, that is interesting. I'm glad I asked. So I think that I cannot have a discussion with you without touching on something that I think is really important, um, specifically where I practice. But can we go over why a cat cannot be a vegetarian? Yeah. And this, this also comes down to making sure that if you do a homemade diet, that it's formulated by somebody who knows what they're doing and understand what the requirements for cats are. Because cats, you know, are, of course, all species are unique, but cats are even a little bit more unique. They're considered to be truly carnivores, whereas dogs are omnivores, but actually sort of carnivorous omnivores. And they have a much higher protein requirement. They require certain types of amino acids like taurine. They have a very specific requirement for a certain type of fat called arachidonic acid, which mainly comes from animal fat, whereas fish oil contains, you know, the omega-3s. And most of the fats and animal that are used from like corn oil and vegetable oil do not have that arachidonic acid in it. And the cats can't convert the fats in the vegetable oil to that necessary essential fatty acid. Um, they have some other interesting requirements for vitamins that, for example, you know, you eat carrots for the vitamin A. Well, what happens is carrots have beta carotene in it and your body converts it to vitamin A. Cats can't do that. Vitamin A is a fat-soluble vitamin that's found primarily in animal tissues, especially animal liver. And so if for all of those reasons and, and others, it's very difficult to make a complete and balanced vegetarian diet. And I will say it's not impossible, um, but it's really tough. And even if you get it balanced, a lot of cats don't want to eat it because they are very driven, again, by the texture and the texture that they like is basically meat. They like that tougher food. They like it with a lot of water. There's uh, the amino acids in animal protein meat is different than what's in plants. And they're driven by some of that and don't want to eat vegetarian diets. It can be done and I have done it, but most of the time we go into it and say, they won't eat this. And they usually don't. They just don't like being vegetarians and, and being vegan is even more impossible because it's really tough to get them all the nutrients they need without animal tissue in the food. Well, thank you so much. I love learning things. Every time I talk to you, I learn something and I'm sure my listeners do too. And so I am grateful. Thank you so much. Oh, it is my pleasure. It's always fun being on and talking about cats. Yes. Well, cats are where it's at. I'm not sure how many lives I have left to keep coming back on the show, but <laughs> I'll, I'll, I don't know that I've lost very many yet either. <laughs> Hopefully not. Well, um, and I know how busy you are and I want to get you back to your day. But I also want to thank Mark Winter, our amazing producer who makes this all come together. And to my amazing listeners, I want you all to go out and have a perfect day. Let's Talk Pets every week on demand only on PetLifeRadio.com.